Hello YouTube. The unification model says that we explain a phenomenon when we uh, use a theory or an argument pattern to unify that phenomenon with uh, various other seemingly disparate phenomena. Today we're going to go through some of the objections to this model. One obvious concern that may have occurred to you is that it seems that unification is perhaps too easy. We can easily come up with theories that unify phenomena. Uh, for example, we can explain almost anything by appealing to uh, the existence of God. Uh, anything that happens in the world, we can say, well, it happened because it was decided by God in accordance with God's plan, you know, whatever that happens to be. You find this with uh, young Earth creationists who think that the world was created in uh, just 6,000 years ago. Uh, there's all sorts of evidence that contradicts this, but creationists always have answers to this evidence not very good answers in my view, but they always find a way to uh, dismiss the evidence or make it compatible with their beliefs. Uh, and, and this can always be done because uh, in, in principle, any evidence you find that seems to contradict creationism, the creationist can say, well, you know, that's just how God set it up for some reason. Um, maybe he wanted to test our faith or whatever. Uh, so remember that Kitcher uh, says that that the explanation is given by uh, whatever uh, theory is the best unifier and the best unifier is whatever theory has uh, the simplest premises but can be used to derive the most phenomena uh, it's whatever yields the most from the fewest well the appeal to god involves very few premises it's a it's 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 a very simple theory uh, god did it perhaps for reasons that we can't know and that's that and this theory can be applied to almost anything we find. Uh, so do we have to say that, uh, that, that, that this appeal to God is the best scientific explanation for various things? Well, surely that would be wrong. Uh, so is that perhaps a problem for the unificationist? Well, I think the unificationist would respond to this by saying that we have to keep in mind the limits of the unification model. Remember that this model is only trying to give an account of the structure of scientific explana explanation. It's not claiming to uh, demarcate science from non-science. There may be other properties aside from unification that we expect of a properly scientific explanation. For example, we might say that for an explanation to be uh, scientific requires that it be empirically testable uh, or falsifiable. Obviously, this isn't the case for an explanation that uses the notion of God. It's not really clear how you could falsify uh, the existence of God. So we shouldn't ask uh, too much of an account of explanation. Any account of scientific explanation will need to be supplemented with an account of the scientific method um, or an account of you know, what, what distinguishes scientific from non-scientific statements and so on. Uh, and this is, of course, what we focused on in the Philosophy of Science series. So uh, you should go and watch that if you haven't already. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that this is uh, all, all that serious of a problem for the unificationist. Uh, a second objection concerns Kitcher's answer to the flagpole problem. R recall that Kitcher says that the reason why we can use the height of the flagpole to explain its shadow but not vice versa, is because the uh, what he calls the origin and development pattern of explanation is simpler and applies to far more phenomena than the shadow pattern. Now the concern here is that this depends entirely on contingent facts. It so happens that we can't derive as much from the shadow pattern as we can from the origin and development pattern. But the asymmetry of explanation here seems seems to be deeper than this. We can imagine a world uh, you know, that, that's different, right? So you know, imagine that things have been different so that we could derive more from the shadow pattern than from the origin and development pattern. Imagine if physics were such that shadows uh, g gave us complete information about an object's dimensions and its mass and its color properties and so on. The thought is that even in this case, the shadow pattern still wouldn't be an explanation. Uh, and of, of course, this is something that's captured in the causal model. The point is that the shadow is caused by the object. Doesn't you know, the shadow doesn't cause the object? And even if we were able to derive more 
about an object by appealing to its shadow than by appealing to how how it uh, originated and developed that you know that that we wouldn't think that the shadow was explanatory um, and so Kitcher's unification model doesn't capture this now I think the main response to this uh, particular point will be to question the legitimacy of the thought experiment uh, can we really imagine a world where we could derive more facts about objects from their shadows than from their origin development. I mean, that, that seems very difficult to imagine. Uh, who's to say how explanation would work in such a bizarre world? Uh, indeed, it's not clear that, that we would have a practice even resembling science in, in this world. In general, we have to be careful with thought experiments. Um, it's very easy to stipulate situations that sound sensible initially, but that aren't really coherent on close analysis. Um, and I, I would suggest that this world we're being asked to imagine, uh, it, it's really not obvious at all how, how anything would work in this world. Uh, and that's incidentally one reason why a lot of contemporary philosophers of science think that we should pay close attention to actual scientific practice and look at how scientists actually work, you know, rather than trying to imagine uh, possible states of affairs for science. Um, so that maybe answers the, the flagpole problem specifically, but there are, however, very similar difficulties here that, that we can't deal with so easily. Uh, so consider Newtonian mechanics. Just as we can use Newtonian mechanics plus the current positions of the planets to predict the orbits of the planets, we can use the same information to uh, retrodict their orbits. So given the current distribution of mass in the solar system, we can derive facts about how the planets must have moved in the past. We can use the Newtonian argument pattern, not just to show how planets will continue from certain positions, but also how those orbits, uh, how those planets got into those positions in the first place. So. It seems that this is a case of unification, but this doesn't seem to be an explanation, right? The, the thought is the present state of the solar system only explains its future states, not its past states. Um, and and, and the, the problem here is that the kind of argument pattern we would use in, you know, in order to explain the future states of the solar system on the basis of, it, of its present state uh, we basically apply exactly the same argument pattern uh, to uh, derive past states of the solar system. But we wouldn't think that the present state of the solar system explains past states of the solar system. Again, the, you know, there's an explanatory asymmetry here, and it looks like the asymmetry is produced by causation. The point is that the past states cause the present states, the present states cause the future states, and the the asymmetry of explanation follows those lines of causation. So although the unification model accommodates some of the explanatory asymmetries that pose difficulties for the deductive nomological model, it doesn't completely solve the problem. Um, of course, you know, I mean, it, it, it is perhaps, I think, a bit more plausible in this case to just bite the bullet and, and say, well, you know, may, maybe present state of the solar system does explain its past states. Um, you know, I'm, again, it's, that would be an extremely counterintuitive position, but I'm not sure whether it's quite bad enough to sink the unificationist model entirely. Okay, another problem is that on the unificationist view, explanation becomes highly global or holistic. Uh, the best explanation is one that unifies um, many other phenomena. Uh, in fact, you know, that's a, not just the best explanation, that is a requirement of explanation. Explanation requires that you, know, you take the thing to be explained, the explanandum, and unify it with many other phenomena. So to, to give an explanation of X depends on what we say about various other phenomena, A, B, C, D, etc., which may be apparently unrelated. There's no room here for uh, what we might call merely local explanation, where we explain something without reference to other things. Now, of course, um, I should note that even on the unification model, uh, we, we can admit that the appeal to other phenomena is usually only implicit. Uh, usually when we give an explanation, we cite the uh, general argument pattern, 
without applying that argument pattern to other cases. So we explain how a particular trait evolved by using the Darwinian natural selection argument pattern, and it's left implicit that this argument pattern applies to many other traits. Nevertheless, um, every explanation requires that it can be applied elsewhere, right? The power of any explanation depends on how that, that argument pattern relates to other phenomena that we're not explaining. So uh, explanation is, is, a, is global. And there are, there's a, a rather serious difficulty with this global approach, which is pointed out by Michael Strevens. Let's take Boyle's law, which we saw in the previous video. This claims that pressure is inversely proportional to volume. We want to explain why this is, right? Why does Boyle's law hold? Well, the answer was given by Daniel Bernoulli in the 1700s. Um, as I noted in the previous video, uh, it, to explain Boyle's law, we would appeal to the kinetic theory of gases, which treats gases as composed of tiny molecules, very rapidly moving in random directions and colliding with each other and colliding with the walls of the container and so on. Uh, we can, in fact, derive Boyle's law from the kinetic theory. Uh, we don't need to go into details. You can see just on an intuitive level how it works. If you reduce the volume, you're compressing the molecules into a smaller space. So there's a greater number of collisions with the wall of the container per unit area. On the other hand, if you increase the volume, then uh, the molecules are going to be f far more spread out, re reducing the number of collisions per unit area. Uh, so that, that that's how Bernoulli explained uh, Boyle's law. Um, now, the unificationist says that the kinetic theory explains Boyle's law only because it can also be applied to explain other phenomena, such as Charles' law, Avogadro's law, Graham's law of effusion, Brownian motion, and so on. And the more of these phenomena that the kinetic theory applies to, the better an explanation it is of Boyle's law. So this is, I think, quite quite bizarre, right? We, we have to say that Bernoulli's explanation of Boyle's law in terms of the kinetic theory has become substantially more powerful as the kinetic theory has been applied elsewhere. It's, it's not just, so we're not just saying that the kinetic theory itself has become more powerful. Rather, Bernoulli's explanation of Boyle's law has become more powerful. I mean, that just seems kind of wrong, right? I mean, are we, are we really going to say that, you know, explaining Brownian motion gives us a deeper understanding of Boyle's law? I mean, that's very strange, but it looks like the unificationist is committed to this because, you know, we, we ha you know our, our, the explanation of Boyle's law requires us to explain other phenomena like Brownian motion. Surely we want to say that the quality of an explanation of Boyle's law uh, depends on what, what that explanation says about pressure and volume. It doesn't depend on what it says about Brownian motion, which is something that is, you know, seemingly completely unrelated. Um, I mean, it, it, another way to sort of see this problem uh, is, is to suppose that um, when the kinetic theory was first proposed, uh, Boyle's law was the, was the only thing e explained by it. It was the only thing that Bernoulli tried to explain by it. Uh, this is actually, I think, close to the truth. Originally, the kinetic theory was applied only to Boyle's law and a few other vaguer facts. But you know, we can certainly imagine a situation um, where we have uh, Boyle's law and you know, we develop a theory just to explain Boyle's law. So in this scenario, um, we've actually failed to provide an explanation, right? If Bernoulli had proposed the kinetic theory merely to explain Boyle's law, he, he would have failed to explain anything. He, he simply would have failed to offer any kind of explanation whatsoever. The kinetic theory uh, would only explain Boyle's law later when uh, other gas laws were derived from the theory. Uh, so, you know, we have this strange situation where uh, the kinetic theory first fails to explain Boyle's law, right? And then later, the exact same theory and the exact same argument from that theory does explain Boyle's law just because the theory is applied to some seemingly unrelated phenomena. That is a very bizarre result. Um, 
a very strange result. Uh, one diagnosis, uh, as it were, of this problem is suggested by Bradford Scoe in his article Scientific Explanation. Scoe says that Kitcher's model uh, simply gets things the wrong way round, right? Kitcher analyzes explanation in terms of unification, but Scoe says, no, that's backwards. Unification should be analyzed in terms of explanation. Uh, Sko says that there are many types of unification in science, but one very important way for a theory to unify phenomena is for that theory to provide explanations of many different phenomena. We say that a theory unifies phenomena when we can use that theory to answer many different why questions. Obviously, Kitcher couldn't accept this definition of unification or his theory of explanation would become circular, right? I mean, K Kitcher's theory would then say that we explain by unifying uh, and we unify by explaining. So th th that would, you know, he obviously can't accept this, uh, this view. Uh, so in other words, uh, what Sko suggests is that the reason the kinetic theory unifies apparently disparate phenomena uh, you know, Boyle's law, Charles' law, Avogadro's law, right? That unification just consists in the fact that it's uh, in in that it's involved in the explanations of Boyle's law, Charles's law, Avogadro's law, and so on. Uh, so, you know, uh, again, ima imagine that Bernoulli proposes the kinetic theory, and when he proposes it, it only applies to Boyle's law; it doesn't apply to anything else. Well we would be inclined to treat this as an explanation. Um, now, you know, obviously we might say that it's a good explanation or a bad explanation. You know, you can debate whether how, how effective an explanation it is, but it seems like that is an explanation. Uh, so, so, so we start off, Bernoulli proposes the kinetic theory merely to explain Boyle's law. Then later, the kinetic theory is used to explain Charles's law and Avogadro's law and Brownian motion. And here we now have unification. So uh, Scow says, yes, Kitcher is right that explanation and unification are deeply connected, but explanation is prior, right? Explanation comes first, and then when you apply the same explanation to many different phenomena, that's when you have unification. And that, I think, does seem like a fairly intuitive uh, analysis of of how explanation and unification are related. Okay, a final problem is that unification in science occurs in many different ways and not all forms of unification seem to have any real relation to explanation. For example, we might apply similar equations to different phenomena. Consider, for example, how Coulomb's law for uh, electrostatic attraction and repulsion, uh, which is on the left here, is structurally very similar to Newton's law uh, for universal gravitation, which is on the right. Uh, now, each has different constants. You've got K in Coulomb's law and G in Newton's law. Uh, and whereas Newton's law only describes attractive forces, Coulomb's law is concerned with both attractive and repulsive forces. Uh, nevertheless, the mathematics here is uh, very similar. Uh, both are inverse square laws. Uh, in both cases, force is, um, well, it, it is proportional to uh, what produces the force. So that's charge in Coulomb's case and mass in Newton's. So, you know, th there seems to be a kind of unification here. But it's not explanatory. Um, and again, what's, what's missing here is uh, causation. Gravity and electricity do not share a common cause, as far as we know. Uh, we might say that the similarity between these laws is a happy coincidence. Now, I'm not sure whether this kind of example is really a persuasive objection to the unification theory. Remember that for Kitcher, unification involves deriving phenomena from certain argument patterns. So I think he would say, well, yes, there's a structural similarity between Newton's law and Coulomb's law, but that doesn't mean that we use the same argument pattern for deriving facts about gravitational forces and facts about electrical forces. Uh, there's more involved in the sciences of gravity and electricity than, than just these laws. So it, this isn't really the kind of unification that's relevant. Of course, on the other hand, we also saw 
that you know argument patterns can be more or less abstract uh, because whenever we you know any argument pattern involves schematic sentences um, and you know so the fact that there is this similarity in the case of these laws you might say that's actually enough to say that there really is the same argument pattern here um, so that's uh, one one kind of problem uh, another rather different example of uh, unification without explanation uh, is the creation of a classification scheme consider classification schemes for ordering astronomical objects I have a, a video uh, on the debate regarding whether Pluto is a planet. It was once classified as a planet, but then in uh, 2006 the IAU decided to demote it. And they proposed the following definition of a planet. So they say that a planet is a celestial uh, body that, number one, is in orbit around the Sun, and number two, is, it, it is, is in hydrostatic equilibrium. And this basically just means that it has achieved sufficient mass to assume a spherical shape. Uh, and three, uh, it has cleared the neighbourhood around its orbit. Clearing the neighbourhood means that it has become the dominant gravitational force in its orbital zone. There are no other large objects in its zone that orbit independently of it. Pluto fails this third criterion. Uh, there are a host of objects uh, in the Kuiper Belt orbiting independently of Pluto. Uh, as I said, if you're interested in this particular topic, please check out my video on uh, I think it's called Is Pluto a Planet? Uh, anyway, this classification seems to provide us with a more unified view of the solar system. Uh, and, you know, similar things can be said about other classification schemes. So think of the Linnaean system of biological classification, where organisms are uh, classified into uh, species, genera, family, order, class, and so on. Um, you know, it, it looks like there's a kind of unification involved here. Uh, since we're unifying all biological organisms under one scheme. Uh, in particular, notice, notice that knowing that an entity is, is classified a certain way, so uh, you know, Jupiter is a planet or whales are mammals, well, we can use this to derive many of its properties. We can say, if, if we know that Jupiter is classified as a planet, we can say that Jupiter is in hydrostatic equilibrium, that Jupiter has cleared its neighbourhood. Um, yeah, if, we, if we know that whales are mammals, we can say that uh, whales are warm-blooded, whales breathe air, whales have um, you know, mammary glands or whatever. Uh, and then we can you know, derive various other facts uh, about, about the object from, from these claims. So if we, if we know that Jupiter is in hydrostatic equilibrium, then that's going to tell us something about its mass uh, and so on. Um, so the point is, if we have some classification X, then when we say that F is an X, well, that allows us to derive various properties of X. So we have a kind of argument pattern here, and we can apply that same pattern of inference to all of the other entities classified as X. So it looks like we have explanation, and in some sense, we also have, uh, have, argument, pa have an argument pattern, as Kitcher required. But surely this wouldn't be an explanation. Um, you know, classification schemes are are just descriptive. Uh, we, we might say it's it's really just a matter of semantics how we choose to classify things. We we already knew all of the properties of whales and of Jupiter. Saying that whales are mammals or that Jupiter is a planet, that's just a matter of adopting a particular organisation of of facts that that we already knew. Uh, this doesn't reveal anything more about the world. Um, you know, the, the, the fundamental problem here, as is noted by uh, James Woodward in the Stanford Encyclopedia article on scientific explanation, that the basic problem here is that Kitcher's conception of unification is really a matter of what Woodward calls information compression. The guiding idea uh, behind Kitcher's model is we derive as many phenomena as we can from the fewest argument patterns as possible. But that is really just a matter of conceptual economy, right? It's, it's just a matter of finding ways of simplifying our theories so that we can express more of what we know with fewer principles. And that's totally tangential to explanation. Explanation is in the business of telling us how the world works. It's about giving us understanding of phenomena. Information compression doesn't necessarily have anything to do with this. So 
Woodward would, 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 would say that uh, you know, Kitcher is just sort of barking up the wrong tree completely uh, in, in uh, with, with this model. Okay, so those were some problems for the uh, unificationist, and I uh, that's all for today. So uh, thanks for watching. Goodbye.